Our New Testament reading today comes from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by him. You were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us now. May the words we hear be your words, and may we put those words into practice, now and always. Amen. I am sure you have heard the saying that the key to any successful business or real estate venture is location, location, location. That is certainly true of the city of Corinth in the ancient world. It was located on the southernmost part of Greece. It was situated on a little isthmus of land that joined the two parts of Greece together. It sat as a port on the Aegean Sea and it was extremely busy. Because of its location, Corinth became a great trading center of its time. Its location was such that almost one had to travel through Corinth to get to certain parts of Greece and so it became a great place of commerce and culture. Unfortunately, with commercial interests and cultural opportunities, that gave rise for great occasions for drinking, for prostitution, for lots of immoral behaviors that a person could lose their soul. It was in this environment that Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians. It was during his second journey, his second missionary journey, Paul spent 18 months in Corinth bringing Christ's message to all the people there. He established a good relationship with the Christians in Corinth. And during his third missionary journey, while in Ephesus, a delegation had reached Paul asking him to help solve some conflicts that had arisen. His letter was written in an effort to solve discourse and immoral behaviors that had surfaced. Now, my life application study Bible lays out, they, they call it the mega themes in this letter. And here they are. The Corinthians were rallying around certain leaders, and it was causing intellectual pride, and it was leading to a division in the church. Because of the rich commerce and culture, there were many reports of sexual immorality, and that led to misconceptions about marriage and about right living. Paul also addressed disorder in worship. The offenses included people taking the Lord's Supper without first confessing their sin, mishandling of spiritual gifts, confusion over women's role in the church, and some denied that Christ rose from the dead. Now, beginning in about chapter 7, Paul takes the time to address these issues and help the people of Corinth in their journey of faith. The letter to the Corinthians is a strong reminder to us of all the challenges of life and faith and how the two fit, or in some instances, how the two do not fit together. Before Paul tackles the task of addressing the issues, he first reminds the Corinthians of the importance of Christ. So today, I, I want to try an experiment with all of you. I want you to think of a current situation in your life, something that you are trying to deal with, something that is causing some difficulty. I'm not going to ask you to tell me what it is, because I'm certainly not going to share mine with you, so I'm not going to ask you to tell me what it is. 
Um, something that you are dealing with, some difficulty, this could be a strained relationship, an illness, it could be grief, it could be troubles at work or at home, it could be difficulty in school, it could be something that is on your mind. Now, if you have no issues, and right now life is perfect, then congratulations. And what I would ask is that you think of a time in your life when you went through some difficulty and some time of challenge. And if you're sitting there and thinking, oh, I've never done that, I've never faced a difficulty in my life, I would ask that you look at your parents and see if they're on fire. <laughs> because that is part of life. We all have them. Okay, so um, we're going to look at Jesus in these nine verses of Scripture, and we're going to see how with Christ's presence, our difficulties can be met and hopefully overcome. So as I do this, think of that situation that I've asked you to do. Now the first thing that Paul conveys is the importance of Christ. Before Paul <coughs> faced the difficulties in Corinth, before he guided and rebuked, before he helped to correct the issues, before he did anything, he first brought the necessity of Christ to light. In these first nine verses of the letter to Corinthians, and I'm using the NRSV translation, in these nine verses, he says God five times, which is a lot. But he uses the words Jesus or Christ or Son or the pronoun. He says that 13 times in those nine verses. For Paul, Christ was central and crucial to all of life. Jesus was first on his mind at the beginning of the day, and he was the last thought in his head when it was time for bed. When Paul wrote this letter, he was addressing difficult situations and challenges that had surfaced in this church. His solution to the troubles that had arisen was to take it to Christ. And that is our first point this morning. When facing a difficult situation, put Christ first. Texting your spouse, emailing your college roommate, telling your best friend over dinner, all great approaches to help you solve your problem. And those approaches are enhanced when Jesus is the first person that we can turn to. In verse 5, Paul says, In every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and in knowledge of every kind. Christ has blessed and enriched every aspect of who we are. So who better to turn to in difficulties than our living Lord? <coughs> the second point is when facing a difficult situation, use your God-given gifts. Paul talks about how we are not lacking in any spiritual gift. God has bestowed on us, each of us, special gifts and talents. Some people are wonderful at teaching or praying or studying scripture. Some have the ability to listen, to advise, to nurture, to show empathy. Some people add to society by using their minds, their mechanical skills, their artistic abilities, their knowledge of technology. Some use their God-given talents in medicine and science and service in the job that they do that is their career. We should never take our talents, skills, gifts, and abilities for granted, and we should recognize that they are given to us by God for very specific reasons. They are given so that we can be the best person that we can be. Our gifts are so that we can serve God to the fullest when we use them. Our gifts are for us so that we can get the most out of our blessings. And so that when facing trials and tribulations, we can use our gifts to conquer our challenges and always to help other people. Every person in this room right now is a special child of God and your contribution to this church is wanted and it is needed. This church is just waiting for your talents and to add Christ's mission to the world. And you may never know how much of a difference you can make in this world, but God knows. And even in dire times, God can use you as his instrument. So it is up to us to share our gifts with others, because in us, God has made a pretty wonderful gift. Now our third point is, when in difficult times, the attitude of Christ makes all the difference. 
grace, forgiveness, salvation, all of these things Christ gives us in abundance. Jesus in our lives gives us a perspective and a perception that others do not share. And how we perceive things and what our attitude is towards things makes all the difference in our lives. So I'm going to share two stories with you to kind of explain and wait for Lewis to catch up, sorry, to kind of explain um, how what we perceive and what our perspective is, how our attitude works, makes all the difference in anything that we face. Now the first story is a once upon a time story about a family, a very well-to-do, very well-known, very rich family who wanted for a birth they present for their father, wanted to have someone write a biography of his life and of the family. And so they hired a professional author to, to write about the family. And when they started, they told him that this family had a secret. Uncle George had been in jail for murder and had been electrocuted in the electric chair for his crime. And they felt it would be best not to embarrass the family and put Uncle George in the book. Now, the author says, I can't do this truthfully and honestly if I don't mention him as part of the family. But I will do my very best to write it in such a way that no one will be the wiser and I won't bring any disgrace to anyone in your family. So they met with him and they commissioned him and he spent all the time putting the book together. And finally the book came out in print. And when it came out in print, there was a mention of good old Uncle George. He was definitely there. And it said, Uncle George held the chair of applied electronics at a government institution. He was connected to his job with the strongest of ties. His work gave him a great charge. And his death came as a real shock. <laughs> In a funny way, perception and attitude does make all the difference. And I want to read, this is a poem that I want to read. I had, uh, at Thomas Group on Thursday, I had shared this because it came out in our discussions. And I, because it's a poem, I, want, I have to read it. I want to make sure I get it right. I don't want to misquote. I can't find who the author is. I went online Thursday, because I've had this for years, to wonder if maybe it had now been assigned an author. And all I found was more versions of this poem. You can find it online, either entitled, I Asked God, or God Said No. And this is the version that I've choose, chosen today. Um, I asked God to take away my pain. And God said, no, it's not for me to take away, it's for you to give up. I asked God to make my handicapped child whole. God said no. Her spirit was whole. Her body was only temporary. I asked God to grant me patience. God said no. Patience is a byproduct of tribulations. It isn't granted. It is earned. I asked God to give me happiness. God said no. I give you blessings. Happiness is up to you. I asked God to spare me pain. God said no. Suffering draws you apart from me, draws you apart from the world and brings you closer to me. I asked God to make my spirit grow. God said, no, you must grow on your own, but I will prune you to make you fruitful. I asked God for all things that I may enjoy life. God said, no, I will give you life so that you may enjoy all things. I asked God to help me love others as much as he loves me. And God says, finally. You are beginning to understand. Perception and perspective and attitude makes a difference in what we do. Our walk with God be, takes on a deeper focus when we put Christ first. Our future and our purpose with God becomes clearer when we use all the gifts that God gives us. Our lives change dramatically when we have the attitude and perspective of Christ in all that we do in our daily livings, and in our deepest challenges. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are ever grateful that you are with us. Please help us in what we endure. We don't ask that you take anything from us. We simply ask that you are with us as we go through it, now and always. Amen.